Hi, I'm Ray with another Sunday podcast episode. You remember I put up a flagpole with the Union flag on top, the Union Jack. I've been reading about it and it's quite interesting, actually. Very interesting. I'll I'll mention that a bit later in the episode, though. First of all, thanks for all your emails. Happy birthday to Laura. Uh, Can I give her a shout out? Yes, it's not a radio station, but happy 18th birthday to Laura. So we do have some younger listeners, which is good. If you want to email me to get a shout out, raise rants at protonmail.com. All one word, raise rants at protonmail.com. Uh, tell you about flags in a minute. First of all, when I was a boy, when I was a boy back in the 50s, I remember my dad getting in from work. The meal, the evening meal, be on the table. I don't know the time, was it six o'clock? He'd come home and he'd have just enough time to change out of his work clothes and sit at the table. And there's the evening meal, because my mum would start preparing the meal at, what, four, half four in the afternoon, so it was ready for when he got in from work. After the meal, he'd wander down the garden to look at the vegetable plot, the vegetable patch. Now, depending on the time of year, he'd either check the cabbages, the sprouts, the winter-type crops, or peas, strawberries, runner beans, leeks, onions, lettuce. It just goes on and on. Black currants, red currants, gooseberries. Uh, yeah, peas. Did I mention peas? I used to sit amongst the peas, shelling them and eating them. <laughs> when I was young, when I was small, that was great, sitting there in the sunshine, in the afternoon sunshine, eating peas fresh from the pod. So that's what he would do. He would tend the vegetable plot for an hour or two and then come in to watch television. Now, in the 50s, in what, in the early 50s, there was only one TV channel, BBC. I think, when did ITV start? 56, 57? So he had the choice of basically two TV channels. And he'd watch Hancock's Half Hour or Harry Worth. Do you remember Harry Worth? Black and white TV, of course. Charlie Drake. Uh, all that sort of, <laughs> all that sort of thing on the telly. So that was the way it was back in the 50s and 60s. These days, in 2022, not only does Dad get in from work, but so does (laughs) Mum. They both get in from work. What do they do? They look at each other. What shall we eat? Do you fancy curry, Thai, Indian, Chinese? And they get onto one of these companies like Just Eat or whatever. And within half an hour, the food is brought to the house. There, There's your evening meal. No cooking, no washing up, nothing. (laughs) <laughs> that's all done what a difference then instead of going to look at the vegetable patch what do they do sit in the lounge tv's on they're not watching that they're on their ipads or iphones checking twitter or facebook or whatsapp or whatever else is on there loads of apps this app that app all sorts of apps then they watch telly which channel i don't know there aren't two channels there are hundreds of channels and so it goes on i, I know people only a couple, I know people, they never cook at home. Every night when they get in from work, they order a a takeaway and they just don't use their their kitchen, well, not for cooking anyway. And they're not alone. You know, people do that these days. They, they, I suppose after a long day at work, they've both been working. This is the difference. They've both been at work, mum as well as dad. Mum doesn't want to start preparing an evening meal after a day at work. You know, she's worn out. She wants to sit down and relax. So, of course... Ding dong. There you go. Avon calling. No, not really. Curry calling. (laughs) Chinese meal calling. And that's the way it is these days. Now, here's the thing. Full circle. What goes round comes round. What are they saying now on the telly and in the newspapers? Grow your own food. We've got this sort of crisis in the world and everything in price is going up. Food is going up. Food is becoming, some of it is unavailable. Was it cooking oil they were saying on the telly? Cooking oil is running out because the sunflower oil comes from uh, Ukraine. And I mean, obviously we can't grow, our, make our own sunflower oil, but they are saying start growing your own food because prices are going up, up, up. So it's full circle, isn't it? Go back to the 50s where everyone grew at least their own vegetables. You can't produce your own meat and things, but vegetables you can grow all that lot runner beans I mean they're dead easy to grow if you've got the land of course a lot of new houses these days they get the, a back garden the size of a postage stamp in the old days the bigger houses the older houses rather had a huge garden 
Our house is, what, 100 years old and it's got a pretty good sized garden, not too big, but it's a pretty good size and we've got plenty of room to grow vegetables if we wanted to. And I'll probably do that. We used to, actually. So I'll probably do that. But isn't it strange? What goes round comes round. Everything goes full circle, whether it be fashion or food, whatever it is. That, you know, it all comes back again, doesn't it? Ripping out fireplaces. Oh, rip the fireplace out. We're done that old rubbish. 10 or 20 years later. Oh, put the fireplace back. That'll look, <laughs> that'll look nice. It'll make a centrepiece. So you go to these um, second-hand type dealers. Oh, you want a fireplace? Yeah, we've got a nice one there. Look, £500. What? But you've got them all for nothing when people rip them out. Yeah, well, that's beside the point. <laughs> but this is how it works, though, isn't it? So people are beginning, I know several people are beginning to grow their own vegetables again. Runner beans, broad beans, easy things like that, that don't take too much knowledge or, or tending and the rest of it. I've heard it mentioned in Parliament, in the, you know, the House of Commons, where they have question time and all that. I have heard them mentioning growing more of our own food, not just people at home, but farmers as well, filling more fields with uh, wheat and barley and stuff like that. I, I don't know what they're... Because they've been cutting down, haven't they, growing our own food. You know, you go to the supermarket and you buy a run of beans and it says, country of origin, Egypt or, <laughs> or Spain. You know, well, we can grow our own beans and stuff. I don't know why it's all been pushed out to places abroad. It, I think of the aeroplanes that have got to fly in all this food, or the ships with the containers. The ships pump out all that diesel, the diesel fumes. Why can't we grow stuff here? We used to. Talking of politicians, I don't like politics. Well, I don't like talking about it on the podcast episodes, but isn't it funny how, how, they, how they talk journalists, newspapers, TV? They'll say... Um, Oh, so-and-so MP for so-and-so, he stormed out of the meeting. And the truth of the matter is that this chap, whoever he was, he didn't storm out of the meeting. Halfway through the meeting, he left. In a, a respectable manner, he left quietly, he just walked out, and that was it. But they all say he stormed out of the meeting in disgust, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> or uh, someone demanded that the Prime Minister do so-and-so. He didn't demand... He perhaps wrote to the Prime Minister suggesting or politely asking whether this or that would be a good idea. Demanded. Or so-and-so MP admitted that he had been to the beach that afternoon. He didn't admit it. If you admit something, it's like, oh, you finally admit it. You've been lying then. You now admit it. All it was, he said, yeah, I went to the beach this afternoon. I don't know, politics. I heard something recently where there were several people... What were they were queuing somewhere and the doors opened and there was a stampede. There wasn't a stampede. I saw it on the TV, the video clip. They just calmly walked in. It was, was it as a shop or something? There was no stampede at all. And they love all this, don't they? The journalists, they love all this stuff. Stormed out of the meeting in disgust. <laughs> the bloke just left calmly, quietly. <laughs> Dear journalists, I don't know. They do get a bad name these days, journalists. Used to be estate agents, wasn't it? And banks. No one moans about estate agents anymore. I think they've all gone. It's all online. But uh, it's all the journalists that get the bashing now. I don't follow politics particularly closely like I used to. But I, I will look at the question time. It's uh, 12 o'clock Wednesdays in the House of Commons. The trouble is now, all it is, is everyone calling everyone else a liar. <laughs> He's a liar, he cheated, he did this, he did that. All sneering at each other, I don't know. Of course, it's on TV and people can see this around the world. I don't know what people must think of our Prime Minister's question time with all this shouting and jeering and accusations going on. You know, I might watch it thinking, oh, I'd be interested to see what's happening to the price of food or you know, the cost of living, the price of petrol and diesel, what's happening around the world. And all you get is, uh, oh, he's a liar. He had cake. No, he didn't. Oh, yes, he did. Oh, dear me. Anyway, there we are. That's enough. <laughs> That's enough about politics. Let's get back to vegetable plots. No, let's get back to flags. Very interesting, this is. You would think, as I thunk. Isn't it funny there's no such word as thunk? Why is it thought, think and thunk? Yeah, but it sounds right, doesn't it? <laughs> Perhaps it doesn't. Anyway, that's another issue. You would think that flying the Union Jack flag, oh, by the way, it could be called the Union flag or the Union Jack, it doesn't matter. I did read where the 
term Jack came from. I've, oh, was it Jack Staff? Can't remember. You'll have to look that up if you're interested, which I know you're not. But you don't just haul a union flag up the pole. Job done. First of all, it has to be the right way up. There is a, a right and wrong way up. If it's the wrong way up, then it's regarded as disrespectful. It's also um, distress. I suppose if you're on a ship and you fly the flag upside down, that means distress. So it's disrespectful. When you haul the flag up the pole, you have to do it briskly. So it whizzes up to the top of the pole, then you tie off the, the rope and that's that. When you bring it down, you must bring it down slowly and respectfully. It's all interesting, this. You have to have great respect for the flag. You don't just yank the rope down, take the flag off, roll it up into a ball and stuff it in your pocket. You have to take the flag down ceremoniously. That was one of the words. What I did, I made the neighbours laugh the other day. Before I hauled the flag down, I stood to attention, saluted the flag, brought it down slowly. <laughs> but that's the way to do it. Well, not salute necessarily. So you bring it down to the bottom, you un unclip it from the rope, and then you roll it up, ceremoniously roll it up. Don't screw it into a ball, stuff it in your pocket. Roll it up and put it somewhere safe. If you're doing a half-mast flag, which in actual fact, I did know this, is about a third down from the top, so two-thirds up the pole, not half. So if you raise the flag, you want half-mast, you put it right the way to the top, then bring it down a third. When you want to take the flag down, you then have to haul it up to the top again, and then bring it down slowly, respectfully. It's all very interesting, all this etiquette and protocol. Also, if a flag is a dirty or it's torn in any way, that is disrespectful to fly it. You, there's no excuse. You can't fly a, a dirty old ripped flag. You have to bring it down and dispose of it. Now, this is another thing. You don't just chuck it in the dustbin. That is disrespectful. All this, I think, goes back a few hundred years. But it's interesting. Well, I think it's interesting anyway. What you have to do is dispose of it respectfully. In private, cut it into strips so it's no longer recognisable as the Union flag. Or if you want to burn it, you burn it in private somewhere. Now, that's how can you burn it in private? I suppose go down the garden on your own when no one's looking. If you want to fly a flag at night, you can, but it must be illuminated preferably by a spotlight which is on the ground shining up to the flag. So you can fly it at night, but it must be illuminated. There are so many things about it. It's quite, it's quite fascinating reading. On, just look up on some of the websites. There's all other uh, stuff about if you fly it next to another country's flag, uh, the Union flag has to take precedence and just so much about it all. It's quite, uh, quite fascinating, actually. Also, the local council, you know, with all the planning permission and the rest of it, they can't tell you not to fly a flag. They can't say you haven't got permission. Apparently, it's everyone's legal right to fly the union flag. The only thing the council can tell you is that perhaps your pole is too high. Also, the flag mustn't be in the way of other things. It mustn't block signs, road signs or whatever, you know, obvious stuff like that. I remember at school, primary school, what was so seven, eight, nine years old, something like that, we had to learn all the flags, well, not all the flags around the world, of course, there's loads of them, but we, you know, in our books, we drew the flags from various countries. It was quite interesting actually doing that. I remember that. And that's how I, you know, I still remember some of the flags now that we learnt back at school. So I don't know whether they still do that at school these days. We also had to draw maps. Uh, one I remember was South America and Argentina, and we drew in there a, a cow, because I think that's where beef came from. It was good. I wonder whether they do all that sort of thing at school these days. They didn't teach us about hauling the Union flag up and down poles and things, but uh, it was interesting. Several of you have said to me over the years, you know, I know you hate school. What did you like about school? There must have been something that you like about school. Uh, yes, um, let me think. I'll tell you what, I'll make a cup of coffee and have a think about that. I'll be back in a minute. I liked science and English. I did enjoy English, writing stories, uh, essays, I suppose they were, and I liked science. The trouble is, my school was a, a secondary modern school for boys, and it was a bit rough, <laughs> to say the least. And the majority of kids, they certainly weren't interested in English. And most of them weren't that interested in science, to be honest. I like science because 
I like the electrical side, electromechanical, electricity, magnetism, experimenting with things like that, batteries and bulbs and magnets, solenoids. It was all great fun. I enjoyed that. But the trouble is the other kids would just mess around, setting fire to each other with Bunsen burners. We didn't do chemistry. I don't know why they had Bunsen burners there. They wouldn't let us... <laughs> Imagine letting us not lose with chemicals, goodness me. Oh, I remember the the science master, he, he set fire to, what was it, magnesium or something. And we all thought, oh, look at that. Oh, I want to get hold of some of that. That's, that's better than penny bangers on bonfire night. I think it was magnesium. Some of you are shaking your heads now saying, of course it's not, idiot. And others are saying, yeah, that's right. <laughs> it is magnesium, isn't it? Anyway, there we are. And we did uh, electroplating, copper plating with copper sulphate. All that sort of thing fascinated me. Dynamos, motors, you know, generating electricity. I loved all that. I still do. <laughs> I'm a proper nerd when it comes to all that sort of thing. Steam engines, I like. I remember the chap trying to teach us about how steam engines worked. I, mean, I did grasp it, but as I say, the other kids, they were either too busy chatting or reading comics, gazing out of the window. I wouldn't have been any good at the grammar school because I was just not academic at all. Mathematics and all that, forget it, I can't add up in my head. <laughs> Just as well we've got calculators these days. But there were certain aspects of, of English and science that I did like, and I would like to have concentrated a little more on that if possible, but of course it wasn't possible at my school. I enjoyed the, the primary school, what do you call that, not middle school, high school, there's high school, middle school then, is it lower? I don't know what you call it around the world. Yeah, I suppose five years old to about eight, nine, ten. That was OK, because at that age, I found that kids weren't nasty. There weren't these big bullies around. You know, we we're all little children. It was fine. It was only when we got to 12, 13, 14 that some of the kids were bullies. And I, I don't know, it all went wrong. So the primary school I did enjoy. I think half the trouble was at the secondary school. That's when you're up to the age of 16. I left at 14. I think I've told you before, I ruptured my liver, ended up in hospital. So I left at 14. By the time I'd recovered, it was then summer holiday and it was just all too late to go back to school, which was a bit of a bonus. But I think the main problem were the teachers. They just, they weren't interested, most of them. They just weren't interested. They were doing a job, they got paid. They just set us some work to do. No one ever did homework. Uh, one or two of the lads did, actually, but uh, I didn't do homework. Loads of us didn't do homework. There was discipline, you know, no running in the corridor, stuff like that, no smoking in school. So there was some sort of discipline. I got the cane for bunking off school, playing truant, as it was called back then. But the teachers really weren't interested. We'd all go into the class, sit down, and they'd say, oh, OK, well, open your books at page 36, uh, chapter so-and-so, OK, read that. And I'll ask you questions on it in a minute. And then the teacher would sort of sit back in his chair with his newspaper, smoking. <laughs> he could smoke in the classrooms, we couldn't. And we're all reading the chapter whatever, page 36. <laughs> it was just all, I don't know, no one bothered. They didn't seem to bother. One of the maths teachers was good. He said to me, you just can't do it, can you? And I said, no, I just can't. I can't do maths. There's some blockage in my head when it comes to figures, numbers. Can't do it. And he said, stay back after school, a couple of days a week, whatever it was. And he said, I'll, I'll try and give you a little bit of tuition on your own for half an hour. And after two or three days of doing that, he said, no, you can't do it. You've obviously got, you know, as I had originally called it, some kind of blockage when it came to figures. I just can't do it now. Long division and all this stuff, multiplication. I could never get my head around it, which did actually hold me back a little bit because with electronics, when I went to college, five-year City and Guilds course, a lot of it, as we progressed, was mathematics. And I couldn't do it. Logarithms and slide rules and all this stuff. I remember when the first calculator came out, I was so pleased. It was hugely expensive, but I was so pleased at last. I didn't have to rely on my brain and make mistakes on bits of paper. I could just tap buttons on the calculator. So going back to when I was sort of seven, eight, nine, ten, that was good drawing the flags, drawing maps of other countries. I like maps. I've got, I think I told you, I picked up a couple of world atlases, big ones, from the uh, 
charity shop at uh, Ambley Chalk Pits Museum near Arundel in West Sussex. Pound each. And OK, they're a little bit out of date. I think they're 15, 20 years old. So is it yeah, politically, is that the word? They're not correct, but geographically they are. Because you know, countries don't move, do they? Borders do and things. Countries' names change. But uh, you don't get like the Isle of Wight drifting off down to, to Land's End, for example. So the maps are correct geographically. But I do like looking at maps. Uh, I, I'm not a map reader. I can't do proper map reading. Of course, again, these days you don't need to. We've got SatNav and we've now... Did I tell you we bought a new dash cam for the car? The other one was getting a bit ancient. But this one, it bleeps and it puts up notices and tells you things. Traffic lights ahead. Uh, you're too close to the car in front. The traffic ahead is moving and you're not sort of thing. And it does that. Oh, also collision. Danger of collision. That's when you're driving along, perfectly normal, correct speed. Someone overtakes you and gets into the gap between you and the car in front. So they've pushed in and you're then too close to the car in front. And it's a warning collision. <laughs> but it's quite good. I like it. It's good fun. We're off to the Isle of Wight. Very soon. We're, uh, in May, Some I can't remember the date. Yeah, we're off to the Isle of Wight for a week, which will be nice. I love the Isle of Wight. So we've been planning where we're going, what we're doing. And Tricia has even been writing down what meals we're having. Because we, we don't go out for meals. It's all too... I can't do that. Do you hate it? I hate going out for meals. I know it's all nice and it's done for you. In fact, we did have a nice meal uh, the other day. Where was it? Amberley, um, not Amberley, Arundel, Swanbourne Lake. There's a nice little cafe or restaurant there, right by the lake, by the water. It's lovely. And I had uh, homemade quiche and chips. You have to have chips. <laughs> and we checked the, uh, the menu. Wherever we go, if we do go out, it's not very often, we always check the menu to make sure there's something I will eat. Otherwise, I'll sit there complaining and moaning. Now, that's not true. You know I never moan. So, yes, we're off to the Isle of Wight. I think we're doing Osborne House uh, cows. We're not going to do the needles because it's quite a walk. And we've got uh, mother-in-law and her ancient friend with us. So they don't want to walk too far, which is great because I don't want to walk too far either. But I can say, oh, well, it's because of them. You know, I'd love to do the, the 10 mile hike, but we better not because of them. <laughs> So I can blame them. So I'm really looking forward to that. I've got to clean the car, get that sorted out, all ready for when we're off. And I've no idea when it is. I must look in the diary. What's the difference between a diary and a calendar? I've no idea. There we are. Doesn't matter. I haven't done a weather report. I'm looking out now at the Union flag flying in the wind. Well, breeze anyway. Blue sky, few clouds. It's cold though. I've got this. Uh, well, now I'm looking at the flag. I can see the wind direction. And it's been coming from the east for the last, what, three or four days. I don't know why it's coming from the east. It normally comes from the west, southwest-ish. Is it south? No. South, south, west, 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 south. <laughs> it's coming from kind of southeast, land's end way, and a bit south. That's normally what it does. But for some reason, it's all been coming from the east, probably from Siberia. That's why it's so cold. But it really is cold out there. If you're in a sheltered spot in the sun, it's lovely. The sun is hot. We've got a few fluffy clouds up there. Oh, I've now got a... No, I won't bore you with that. I've just bought another radio and it listens to the aircraft. I've already got aircraft radios, but this is a professional one and it's rather nice. So I listen to the pilots as they come out of Shoreham Airport, which, as you know, I've moaned and complained about before because they call it Brighton City Airport. And it's not, it's Shoreham Airport, but we won't go into that. Talking of which, I can hear a plane. I hasten to add that you're not allowed to talk to the pilots. You can't uh, look up and think, oh, look, there's a plane. Get on your radio and say, all right, mate, where are you off to then? <laughs> I, don't think, I don't think a British Airways pilot flying a jumbo across the channel would appreciate me saying, hey, where are you off to then? Where, where are you going, Australia or where? Yes, I don't know what they do. Highly illegal, highly illegal. That's uh, like the flag. It's not, not etiquette, it's not protocol. <laughs> I wonder what they'd say. It's all right talking to the ships. Well, it's not, but I used to. The fishing boats, that is, when I was in my teens, first getting into radio, I'd uh, from my bedroom window, I could see a little bit of the sea and you'd see the fishing boats out there. And I'd say, how are you doing, lads? What, what have you caught? Anything? Most of them would 
take no notice. But one or two would say, oh, yeah, hello, because they knew. They knew it was me. <laughs> and uh, they'd tell me what they caught and what they were up to, stuff like that. Highly illegal, but perfectly harmless. In the, what was it that Kenny Everett used to do? Swing his legs around in the best possible taste. That's another thing they've had in the House of Commons recently, isn't it? Um, ladies' legs. I, I, don't, I don't think I'm going to bother to watch Prime Minister's Question Time anymore. It's all become a farce. I haven't even told you what day it is. Well, I know it's Sunday when the episode comes uh, online. But uh, today it's Friday. And the sun is really... The flag's now hanging limp. A limp flag, so there's no breeze even. That's rather nice. Actually, it's a good... I used to have a weather vane, but this is a good indication to what the wind's doing. The weather vane I had was like a big chicken thing and it used to fly around in the wind and squeak and things. That was good. It rusted in the end and all rusted away. But the flag's good. I take the flag down. Did I tell you? You have to put the flag up at sunrise, which I think at the moment is 545 and take it down at sunset, which is eight something or other. Well, I don't go out into the front garden at 5.45 and put the flag up. I wait. But uh, so there's even times when you have to take the flag down and put it up. As I said, if you fly it at night, it must be illuminated with a, a spotlight. There we are. It's now. Ah, now we have a north wind. Now, that is not good coming from up north, up to north, because it's cold up in Iceland. And that's where the, where the wind's coming from. I'll have to look on my app. I've got Ventu Sky, which is good. Ventu Sky, and it shows the wind direction and speed and all that sort of thing. Talking of uh, mobile phones, which we weren't, but we kind of were because of the app. Uh, Trisha, yesterday, her phone seized up. Totally seized up. Now, the old Bakelite phones back in the 1950s, they didn't seize up. They worked all the time. See, modern technology. Anyway, it seized up. So we're looking online as, as what to do. Press the volume thing up and then down or whatever it was and then press the side button. And it went and did the emergency. It called 999, which is, what is it in America? Is it uh, 911? Anyway, it called 999. And she couldn't stop it. And she's pressing things. The whole thing had seized up. And of course, then you get this lady. What, it, uh, what do they say? Police, fire or ambulance? And Trisha say, no, none, none, none. It's my phone. It shouldn't have called you. <laughs> And, of course, there's a couple of other emergency numbers. I'm one of them. Her sister's the other one. Her sister's panicking. I phoned her sister to say, it's all right. It's all right. I've got an emergency from Trish. No, no, it's all right. It's the phone playing up. So, anyway, I think that's all right now. I don't know why it did it. As I say, we should, we should go back to the old proper Bakelite phones. I've got the candlestick phone. Do you remember that? I, did I tell you about that? I restored it all. An old candlestick telephone. That's in the hall by the front door. Looks really nice there. Proper bit of telephone equipment. None of this modern rubbish. <laughs> Happy days. The flag's now limp again. It's not doing anything, which is nice. I don't like wind. I don't like wind at all. I don't suppose the old Bakelite phones will ever come back because, well, landline phones are disappearing. Uh, another two people recently have said to me they've got rid of their landline phones. Don't use them. They've got mobiles, which seize up and call the emergency services. <laughs> oh, I don't know. I don't know all this modern stuff. It's great when it's working, isn't it? Computers and everything, it's great when it works. When it goes wrong, it's a nightmare. So, yes, what goes round comes round. Fashion, we've seen that with fashion. Mini skirts in the 60s, they came back. I can't remember when that was. They came back a little bit into fashion, didn't they? Ripping out fireplaces and putting them back. Growing your own food during the, especially in wartime in the 40s. And the 50s, well, and 60s, now that's coming back again. What we've been doing, because the price of gas and electricity all rocketing, that's another thing, journalists, you, you know, the price is rocketing. It's not increasing, it's rocketing. <laughs> price has gone through the roof. I don't know why stuff goes through the roof, especially the price of something. But we've been saving up, because we've got a coal fire, we've been saving up bits of wood. Uh, we've been given some coal. A couple of people recently, they got rid of their coal fire. So they said, yeah, do you want our coal? Yeah, we're round there with a, a bucket and bags and things, collecting all their coal. Because this winter, seeing as prices are going up and up and up, we're hoping to make a little bit more use of the coal fire in the dining room, which would be nice, actually. And we light it anyway, but we have the central heating on, of course. And perhaps this winter, if things are horrendously priced, 
gone through the roof, <laughs> skyrocketed, they will make more use of the coal fire, which will be nice. The wind's coming from the north again. Anyway, we don't want to talk about the winter. I'm looking forward to the summer. We've got to buy our tomato plants and uh, a grow bag and some compost stuff and all that for the garden, which will be good. There's nothing like homegrown, well, anything, homegrown anything. Tomatoes picked straight off the plant. Is it a vine? Straight off the vine, I think. They're absolutely wonderful. Straight off the plant. Oh, tastes beautiful. Anything. Peas straight off the, the, uh, the pea plant. What are the pea plants called? Vines, oh, they're pea plants. They're nice. Apples, used to have an apple tree at a house I had years ago. Beautiful apple tree in the garden. Wonderful apples. I don't know what type they were, but they were really nice. They weren't cooking apples. They were really nice apples. We had a crab apple tree once. I don't know what crab apples are for, really. I, I think you can make crab apple jam or something. But I don't know. I, I don't. You can't just eat them, I don't think. But I really am hoping that we're going to go back to all this growing our own stuff in Britain again. Kent was the, was it the Garden of, not Eden, the Garden. That's where they grew all the hops for the beer. I don't know whether they still do. I went to a brewery down in, oh, now where was it? Somewhere down the West Country, Somerset Forum, Branford Forum, Badgers Brewery. And they're showing us hops, well, you know, just bags of stuff. And they come from all over the place, you know, various places, uh, not just locally, all different types of hops to give the beer different taste. That was quite a good trip, actually. I like the West Country. Oh, before I forget, remember I talked about the swap shop that we had in Worthing uh, last Sunday? Uh, two or three people have contacted me and said they had a similar thing, a swap shop in their town when they were kids. They've all gone now, of course. But uh, yeah, really nice to hear from people and their experiences. Same as mine, actually. It doesn't, where was one of them? One of them was Northampton. Uh, one was, I think, somewhere in Wales. But the, exactly the same sort of thing. They'd go in there with marbles or toy cars and swap. Or if they had a bit of pocket money left, they'd buy something. It was great. The swap shop. There was a programme, wasn't there? A multi-colour swap shop on the telly. Uh, was that with Noel Edmonds? I've no idea. I didn't watch it. I think I was too old by then. But several people have said, messaged me and said, you know, so many of their local shops have gone. And they talk about bringing back the high street. As I said, in the 50s, when I was a kid going into town, so many shops, greengrocer, butcher, the wool shop, the, the ironmonger shop, everything, the tool shop, different shops, loads and loads of shops. Whereas now, I don't know, I don't go into town anymore. There's nothing down there apart from coffee shops, food places, charity shops there's nothing else. I mean there are one or two shops of course but selling different things I suppose but there's nothing uh, nothing to interest me now here's the thing will that be full circle what goes round comes round will the shops come back will all the big supermarkets disappear and the little shops come back in the high street I doubt that very much but you never know you can't tell what's going to happen things change don't they people's habits change and whatever Will people live in the town anymore in the future? You know, shops are always or usually in the centre of the town, aren't they? And the houses are all built round the kind of centre of the town. And the town expands, more houses spread out from the centre of the town. Well, if the centre of the town is no longer kind of the main place to be for shopping and the rest of it, if there is no centre, it's just all living accommodation... For example, all shops are online or all way out of town. That, that's going to be interesting, isn't it? There'll be nowhere to kind of gather, apart from the, you know, the out-of-town retail park. Everyone gathers in Sainsbury's or Tesco's <laughs> or Aldi, Lidl. That's not the same, is it? The pubs are all disappearing. A town, it'll be nothing, will it? Just a bunch of houses, a bunch of flats, places to live. There'll be no centre I don't know. That's interesting. Maybe people will start moving out into the countryside. Now, there's a thought. I'd like to do that. I wouldn't mind that at all. I'd like to live in the middle of the woods. That would be nice in the middle of the woods. But of course, then <laughs> you've got to get food. Well, food will be delivered by a drone, wouldn't it? I think Amazon are already testing deliveries with drones. So you're out in the middle of the woods. It doesn't matter where you are. Cut off totally. And you're shopping and whatever else you've bought online turns up with this drone buzzing around the back garden, dropping it onto your 
drone pad or whatever, helipad. <laughs> you never know. All this stuff, you know, we laugh about it now, about, oh, in the future this will happen, driverless cars, driverless trains. It's all coming, isn't it? It's all happening. It's all coming. I've just remembered Kent is the Garden of England, is it? Not the Garden of Eden. <laughs> that wasn't in Kent. The Garden of England. And it's very flat, isn't it? Where they grow all the hops for the beer. Nothing wrong with the beer. It's Friday. I might have a beer tonight. I put a couple in the fridge earlier, just in case I might need one or two this evening. My birthday coming up this weekend. So we've got a few people round. We're having Chinese takeaway. There we are, talking about takeaway food. That was, I decided on Chinese. Trish said, what do you want to do on your birthday? Go out for a meal. And I looked at her and she said, no, no, you don't, do you? No, no, I don't. So we're having brother-in-law, sister-in-law, mother-in-law, one or two other family, just a small get-together for a Chinese takeaway, which would be rather nice. OK, I want to tell you a story. I know a few of you like these stories. This is a, no, it doesn't involve a girl. I'm not going to say now, a girl I knew. I'm not going to say that because it's a chap I knew. He came into a lot of money, and I mean a lot. I don't know how much, but uh, shed loads. <laughs> That's a funny expression. You imagine a load of garden sheds full of used notes. Shed loads of money. And he bought this house many, many years ago. In fact, the house he bought, he for the day he moved in, and I went to have a look, he said, I don't know why this dining room is so big. Someone had built an extension and it was, I don't know, it was like two or three rooms in, in one, massive, on the back of this house. And he turned it, would you believe, into a pub. <laughs> he built a bar and had all the optics and he, he had the chairs and the tables around. He got a jukebox, he got a fruit machine. He built a pub. Now, you can't sell alcohol, you're not licensed to sell alcohol from home. So what he did was say to the locals... Pop in if you want to pop round, bring your own beer. Uh, by, by locals, I mean friends, neighbours, family. And people started doing that. Instead of going to the local pub, he lived just outside the town and there was a pub. It wasn't quite a village. One of these situations where the village had been merged with the town, which I've moaned about before. So people started to go quite regularly. They'd take their own drinks round there. And what they did with the bottles or cans, they'd put their name on them and then put them in this big fridge that he had to keep them cool. So whenever they wanted a drink, they'd open the fridge and take out whatever was theirs. And it was great. I went there a few times. It was really good. The trouble is the local landlord of the pub, the local pub, his takings started falling. He was losing customers, <laughs> as he put it to someone, hand over fist. And he didn't know what was going on. Now, I didn't go into that pub. It wasn't, you know, this was just a friend of mine outside town. It wasn't a pub I went into. Now, this private pub or whatever he called it, a private club. I don't know, it wasn't called anything, it was just his house. That's how public houses started, isn't it? Back in the good old days, was it 1700s or whenever? That's how public houses started. I mean, people used to open up their front room as a shop, didn't they? You know, knock out the window, put a shop front in, and they'd sell local produce or whatever to the local people. In fact, fish and chip shops started that way. Someone would get a, a huge you know, chip fryer, a fish fryer thing in, in their back room and start selling fish and chips to the neighbours. <laughs> back in the days when you didn't need all this uh, planning permission and licences and what have you. So this chap, anyway, is a bit of a long story, but this chap was, I was going to say, doing very well. He didn't make any money, but the landlord of the local pub called the cops. This local cop and his mates turned up. I wasn't there, unfortunately, but apparently there were four cops that turned up in a van one evening and they burst in. There we are, I can use one of these journalist words. They burst in, they stormed. Uh, they probably just strolled in and just said, right, everyone stay where you are. That bit's true. I don't know about the storming in, a stampede. <laughs> and they said, right, yeah, who owns this place? Blah, blah, blah. The chaps said, well, me. And he showed them in the fridge. He said, look, this is the beer they bring themselves. This is their own drinks. And he got away with it, would you believe? Well, not would you believe. I mean, he wasn't taking money. He wasn't selling alcohol. So he got away with it. Now, this is where it gets interesting, as if that last bit was perhaps boring. The cops turned up a couple of months later, different cops this time, and they had a search warrant. And they searched his house, the whole house. Apparently, 
they'd been tipped off that he was running a house of ill repute. There's an old-fashioned term. I'm going back decades. A house of ill repute. <laughs> Which he wasn't, of course. And again, I wasn't there. I missed this. I wasn't there. Him and a few of the other lads reckoned it was this landlord that had, you know, gone to the cops with daft stories just to get rid of him or get him locked up or something. Now, the police found nothing. There was nothing to find, so off they went. And he decided he'd had enough. So he kept his pub, his big room, he kept it as it was, but it was for just friends, immediate friends, uh, good friends and, and family only. So that was it. None of the others used to, to pop it anymore. He said, no, I, I can't do this anymore. Landlords obviously got it in for me and, you know, there could be more trouble ahead. So he finished it. People started to drift back to the local pub as there was nowhere else to go. And it transpired that the pub was due to close. Nothing to do with this friend of mine taking away business. It had been going to close anyway. It had been planned for about a year, I think someone said, that it was going to close down. The brewery were going to close it because it just wasn't profitable. Nothing to do, as I say, with this chap. So once this friend of mine got wind of this, he got on to the brewery and he bought it. Now, <laughs> and he bought it, he got, he got the licence and the rest of it, and he opened it as a pub. He just carried on with the pub. Of course, now it was a free house, not tied to the brewery. This is the interesting bit. He came into all this shed loads of money after his divorce. Now, he got divorced, him and his wife. They had lived in a rented place. They didn't have a great deal of cash. They, she ran off with someone else, someone younger. She was dreadful to him. She wouldn't let him see their child. I think it was a daughter they had, I can't remember. Wouldn't let him see their child. Came out with all sorts of stories about him, dreadful, grisly tales. And that was it, they divorced. He was then left all this money by some relation of his. And, uh, of course, that's when he bought the big house. And now, he still kept the house, but he's bought the pub. So it was obviously money, big time. Money was no object whatsoever. So one evening, <laughs> it's quite a long story, I'm trying to cut it down a bit. I was in his pub having a beer and chatting to him. And this lady walked in. It was his ex-wife. Oh, hello, nice to see you. Oh, I'm so sorry, blah, blah, blah. We must get back together. She obviously heard about all the money and wanted to get back with him. Now, here's the thing. <laughs> here's the thing. She had been the one that had told uh, the police about the, the pub at home. She had been the one that had told them about the house of ill repute. It wasn't the landlord at all. All this transpired later because she'd heard that he got all this money and she didn't have anything and she was miserable and just wanted to somehow get her own back to, I don't know, she left him. But she'd been dreadful to him. Anyway, she came into the pub and she was saying to him in front of me, we ought to get back together, you know, I, I made a mistake, I should never have left you and I'm so sorry you haven't seen, I think it was the daughter, I forget her name. Anyway, this other lady was behind the bar and uh, she came over and served the ex-wife and the ex-wife said something to him about the, the barmaid. And he said, that's not the barmaid, that's my wife. He recently married. Him and his new wife were running the pub. It was, honestly, you, you couldn't make this up. Truth stranger than fiction. You know, this really did happen. And of course, this ex-wife, she stormed out of the pub. <laughs> and the thing is, his daughter got back in touch with him. And uh, they became very close, which was, which was lovely. You know, they became close and... Uh, I don't know what happened to the ex-wife, but uh, you know, she had been despicable, telling lies, you know, social services she'd been to and telling lies about him, just to spite him, really. But what for? Because she left him. I, anyway, there we are. So that's a little bit of a story. Uh, no embellishing going on. In fact, if anything, I've sort of cut the story down. I haven't added anything to it. I've taken bits out, if anything. So uh, I'm not a unreliable narrator <laughs> in this case i'm not an unreliable relator relate always saying relate narrator goodness great what have we done 45 minutes and it's friday i'm definitely going to have a beer tonight perhaps i ought to convert the dining room into a pub no no i don't think that's a good idea <laughs> not the cops coming around here it, that reminds me actually of another chap i knew he's passed away now sadly him and his wife split up he was a lovely chap. I never met his wife. I didn't know her. I only met him years after they'd split up. 
And he said to me that uh, he put out a little rumour about, because he, he wasn't able to see his son. I think his son was 18, 20, something like that, early 20s. He couldn't see his son, his wife's doing, I suppose. So he put this little rumour about that he'd come into some money. Now, he put the rumour about with to people that knew his ex-wife, so he knew it would get back to her. I think he said seventy or £80,000 he'd come into. I'm going back a few years, so it's quite a lot of money. And lo and behold, as he put it, <laughs> lo and behold, his son contacted him. Hello, Dad. How are you? And all this sort of business. Oh, it'd be great if we could kind of get together, have a drink together. You know, I'd like to see you. So they arranged this, this meeting in, in a pub somewhere to have a drink. And uh, the son apparently started saying, uh, oh, you know, it's really nice to see you. A bit short of money. I'm having some money trouble. And his dad just said, oh, well, that's a shame. I don't know verbatim, obviously, as I've said before. But the conversation went something like this. And the dad uh, just started chatting about other things. Where, where do you work? What sort of job have you got? Have you got a girlfriend? Yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. I'm very short of money, Dad. You know, I, I owe some people some money. And <laughs> see, the dad kept sort of evading the, the subject, the question or whatever. And eventually the son said, I hear you came into some money, Dad. I just heard that you've got some cash. So the dad said, uh, money? Who told you that? And the, the, the boy went and said, oh, well, uh, Mum told me, actually. And this friend of mine and his dad, he said, uh, I wish, I wish, I haven't got any money. I don't know where that one's come from. And apparently the son's face just dropped mouth open uh oh oh okay finished his drink and left didn't see him again years later he said this was didn't see him again never did see him then this friend of mine the other you know, dad he, he died he passed away in fact i went to hospital to see him that wasn't very nice uh and his last hours really lovely man lovely man one of the nicest people i think that i've met but there we are so uh isn't it awful that some people use their children as ammunition you know, when they split up, they think the kids are kind of some ammunition and you have to be blackmailed with and use them. Oh, dear, it's dreadful. Of course, it's not always like that. I knew another couple. They split up. They had three kids and they remained friends. Uh, they both went off, married other people, and they remained good friends. Uh, the kids and everything. There was no arguing, no anim animosity. That's a difficult word to say, isn't it? Animosity. <laughs> bad feeling that'll do no bad feeling so you know it doesn't always happen but when it does using the children as kind of blackmail material and things it's such a shame there we are the sun is still shining the wind is now it's turned it's now coming from the west as it should do as it normally does here on the south coast of great britain or the uk whatever you fancy okay i'm going to end it here coming up to the hour Ray's Rants at ProtonMail.com if you'd like to email me. And, uh, my voice is sounding a bit rough. Have you noticed that? It's sounding a bit rough. Perhaps I'd better, uh, uh, perhaps I'd better go and have that beer after all. No, I think we're popping out this evening. I think we're going to wander up the road to our club and have a couple of drinks up there. We only go for an hour or so on a Friday, which is quite nice, just to, you know, just to show our faces and support the club a little bit, which is rather good. And we've got uh, the weekend coming up. Don't know what we're doing at the weekend. My birthday, of course. And I think my, my, yeah, my mother's popping round for lunch, I think, on Saturday. Anyway, you don't want to know all that. Take care. Thanks for listening, as always. I shall see you Wednesday for the midweek message. Will there be a story for next Sunday? I don't know. You tell me. Do you want a story? Email me. Let me know. Have you got a story? That would be interesting. You tell me a story. I want to hear a story. <laughs> Take care. Look after yourselves. See you Wednesday. Bye-bye for now.